Yes. Yes. Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Great. So um, I'm just going to give a super quick introduction to our guests today, and I'll, I'll let them give um, a, a better introduction to the project we're going to be discussing. But I'd like to welcome um, Drs. Roger Merkel and um, Terry Gibson from Langston University American Institute for Goat Research, as well as Dr. Megan Rolfe from Kansas State University. They're going to talk to us about a really cool project um, with some cashmere fiber testing. So I will uh, send it over to you and I can drive the slides. So anytime you want me to advance the slide, just let me know. All right. Thank you, Danielle. As you mentioned, I'm Roger Merkel. I work at the American Institute for Goat Research at Langston University and have been there, I don't know, 20, 22 years or something like that and do uh, uh, some, some research, some extension, some teaching, and then, and then some other things. And the grant that we're gonna talk about tonight is a, a grant that was awarded uh, last year to me. So, and we're getting started now on the, on the working of that grant, the conduct of that grant. And I'll see if Terry or, or Megan, you have any, anything you wanna say? No, I think that covers it, Roger. Megan, you want to introduce yourself? How do you know so much about this way? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here this evening. Uh, my name is Megan Rolfe, and as um, was mentioned, I, I work at Kansas State University, and um, my crew is going to be doing a lot of the genetic analyses on the project um, in collaboration with Roger and Terry. So um, I think that's primarily what I'll visit with you about this evening, but I'm glad to be here and, and to see so many people on the call. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, we're lucky to have Megan. She and her graduate student are going to do all the heavy lifting on this grant, and Terry and I are, are going to coast more or less, I think, is what at least what my, my plan was. Danielle, if you want to go to that first uh, summary slide. So I wanted to give just a few slides, uh, introduction to the American Institute for Goat Research, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Uh, and you will see E. Kika de la Garza above that. And he was a, a representative to Congress actually from the state of Texas. And the Institute was originally at Prairie View a and University down by Houston. And then it moved up to Langston University right around 1984. So the Institute has been there since that time. And Langston is uh, in the center of Oklahoma. We're about 30 minutes from Stillwater, Oklahoma. And um, the Institute, or I'm sorry, the university, we are an 1890 land grant institution, a historically black college and university. And here in the state of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University is our 1862 counterpart up there in Stillwater. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> So the research that we do is uh, funded by a variety of sources. Uh, the, the main source of our research is through USDA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture funding, and most of those are competitive grants. The funding that is supporting this fiber research grant is an 1890 uh, capacity building program grant from USDA NEFA. We do apply and receive some funding for international research from other, uh, other organizations. And that bottom bullet there, Evans Allen support, uh, some of you may be aware of that, that is, would be what our formula, formula funding would be then from USDA to support most of our research. Next one, please. So this is just a listing of some of the research that we have done in the recent past, some we are doing now, some, some people have left, we don't uh, have a lactation person on at, at the moment, for example. But as you read through that list, one of the things you'll notice that is not listed is anything to do with animal fiber, either cashmere or mohair. When the Institute began uh, in the mid 1980s, Angora goats were the main goat in the United States. And indeed, there was, there was research on mohair and other fiber done at the Institute. Uh, as 
the number of angoras and the importance of fiber uh, to the small ruminant industry decreased over time than most of our research has, has been with meat goats and also with dairy goats. Next slide, please. One of our big research projects uh, that was done just a little while ago was doing an update to the NRC for um, goat nutrient requirements. And we had a team led by our research leader, Dr. Art Goach, who went through the research and developed equations uh, for determining nutrient requirements of different classes of goats, different production capabilities of goats. And those then were used by the uh, National Research Council when they up updated their NRC requirement for goats. In the early 80s, there was one that was published just for goats, in NRC. Uh, in the new NRC, you can see the title there on the bottom right, it's nutrient requirements of small ruminants and new world camelids. So the goat portion in there was really based upon the work that was done at Langston University. That work then was taken by the university, by uh, scientists there, and in large part, uh, Terry Gibson did quite a bit of this work, where we developed an online nutrient calculator that uses those NRC equations. And we also have a least cost ration balancer uh, on our Institute website that it was free to use for, for anyone. Next slide, please. In the area of extension, and uh, Terry is our extension leader, uh, these are some of the activities that we have done in the recent past, some that we are doing, uh, doing currently as well. And as you read through those, some of the ones that we're still doing, we've done AI workshops. Uh, tanning goatskins workshop is one, one thing that I do, and we'll be talking a little bit about that later on uh, this evening. We generally have a goat field day. Uh, last year it was virtual uh, because of COVID, and it may still be virtual again this year. Next slide, please. So these are the handbooks that uh, we have developed at Langston University. We have a meat goat production handbook, a dairy goat production handbook, a meat goat production basics, and a dairy goat production basics handbook that have all been translated and printed in Spanish. These handbooks have also formed the basis of an online training program that we have for meat goat producers and dairy goat producers, where the, uh, a person can go enroll in that course, complete that course, and then uh, become a, a certified producer. You can see a couple of the logos there, uh, quality meat producer, quality dairy producer, and we can provide those to people who have completed the course. One thing that you'll notice on this slide too is there's nothing dedicated to fiber goats. And as part of the grant we're gonna talk about this evening, we hope to produce a supplement to the meat goat handbook that does deal with some specific aspects of raising fiber goats, cashmere and angora. We'll talk about that here in, in a bit as well. Uh, these online programs are, are, are pretty popular. And uh, Terry, I know you just looked at this. Could you chime in on the numbers of people that have completed? Uh, we've had a little over um, 700 people that have completed, uh, much more on the meat goat because we actually put the meat goat online several years before we put the dairy goat. Uh, but the, uh, the dairy goat producers are, are starting to catch up. And we have how many different countries represented? Uh, I just did a report on that. I think we have 47 different countries um, in every state in the nation. Yeah, so it's really, really spread around the world. We, we have a group from Chile that just completed mainly the dairy goat program, uh, but some of those also completed the meat goat program. And if any of you would like to look at any of these books or, or, or purchase any of these, you, know, you can get a hold of me and, and we can get that, that arranged as well. The next slide, please, Danielle. We also do some international activities. Um, and this is just tells you a little bit about some of the things that, that we have done. We've worked with Ethiopia quite a bit 
in East Africa, and you can see some of the other countries where we've done some work as well. We do host some foreign scientists and students who want to come to Langston to have a training course uh, in goat production, and we can kind of dovetail the uh, training to their needs. We also have people from NGOs here in the US who are going to work overseas come for a, a training program on, on some specific topics. And those pictures at the bottom, the one on the left is I'm in the Philippines um, working with uh, an extension group there. That center picture is our uh, former farm manager, Mr. Jerry Hayes, who recently retired, and he's helping to train a, a Japanese master's degree student who was here for a month. And then on that right-hand picture, that's Terry in Kenya after some training on uh, semen collection and artificial insemination. Next slide, please. So again, that's just a brief overview. It's not the intent of this evening, but I just wanted to introduce the Institute to you. And this is our web address. Uh, please feel free to go on and, and you know, browse around and see what you can find in our library and in our training programs and, and things like that. Uh, go ahead, Danielle, next one, please. So to get to the grant that we're talking about this evening, the title of this is Supporting the Fiber Goat Industry uh, Through Producer Education and Genetic Selection Assistance. And I think Danielle sent this out to, uh, to the producers, is that correct or not yet? Uh, yeah, I believe Christine sent it out with, to our membership list, but if mm -hmm. anybody doesn't have this, they can um, put their email in the chat and I'll mm -hmm. send it out. Yeah, so there's, uh, I'm certainly not gonna read this for you. Some of you may have already read it, but for those who, who haven't seen this before, uh, there's really three aspects of the program or the grant. And the first is uh, genetic analysis. And those first couple paragraphs deal with that. And uh, Megan's gonna talk about that a little bit more here uh, in, in a moment. But the goal of that portion of the grant is to try to find genetic markers that then are correlated with some fiber characteristics, particularly mean fiber diameter of, of goats, of these cashmere goats. So that goats that do have superior genetic potential for that trait then can be identified at a younger age rather than having to care for that goat for two to three years uh, and uh, raise it and, and shear it and, and so on. If we can find some markers that are associated with those traits, then that could speed up genetic progress on your farms and also could help you with culling decisions at an earlier age that then you could perhaps save some, some money from not having to feed out animals that, uh, that are not going to give you the type of fiber that you would like. And that's really what we're here to talk about about tonight. The second portion of this grant relates back to our production handbooks in that we don't really have a section or a portion on fiber production. And what we'd like to do is to create a supplement for that book that deals specifically with fiber goats. And the chapters that, that we would like um, you know, I have some ideas in mind, you know, harvesting cashmere, storing cashmere, spinning, marketing uh, products you can make. There may be nutrition aspects of cashmere production, you know, follicle structure, those types of things. But since this book is really to be aimed at producers, um, we'd certainly love feedback from your group. Any, any suggestions and things that you might have for us on chapters or modules that we could create and then potential authors of that material. And please, please feel free to send me any of that, any of that information because this is supposed to be created for producers, particularly to help guide those producers who are new to raising fiber goats so that they can better understand what good fiber looks like, what you need to look for, those types of issues but also to help provide some uh, perhaps more in-depth information to some established producers as well. The last portion of this grant, which is really the smallest portion, 
is looking at the skins of some of those cull animals that you have that may not meet the fiber characteristics that you desire, but whose skins still do have value. And is looking at working with tanneries to tan those for sale. And I believe some of your producers already do that. And also perhaps to, to do some tanning by hand. And I'll have a, you know, we'll have a, a workshop, an online workshop or something where I'll go through through that process because that may be some way that you could add value to your skins or perhaps even have trainings for interested people on your farms, again, to help add value to your, to your operation. So those are really the three main aspects of this grant, the genomic analysis, the supplemental uh, book, and then finally tanning of the, of the goat skins. Go to the next screen, Danielle. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop up or throw them in the chat. I haven't been monitoring that. Let's see. If there is anything, I assume Danielle will, will tell me or tell us. Sure, I'll let you know. So here are these next couple of slides are really uh, Megan's slides. So I'm gonna let her talk a little bit more about this genetic analysis and, and uh, uh, the, the genomic analysis that she and, and her team is going to do. Great, thanks Roger. Um, so as Roger mentioned, one of the things that we want to do is try and identify uh, markers or regions of the genome that really influence some of these fiber quality traits. Um, so one of the pieces of information that we'll talk about later that's really important in that, um, in addition to the phenotypes, um, is the pedigree. So we'll talk about um, a form that we can use to submit that information. But I want to just kind of talk about the general pipeline a little bit of how we kind of go about associating and identifying these markers. So the first key is that we need a really large population of goats. Um, so that's why you see a, a giant square here with a ton of different goats in it. So the idea is to sample um, as broadly as we can to um, get a wide variety of, of germplasm and genetics in that sample. And of course, from those animals, we want to extract the DNA. So that's why you see a little helix there. And what happens with that DNA is it's actually run on what is called a SNP chip. And I put a little picture of that on here because when I was in graduate school, I talked about SNP chips for years and my family thought it was SNIP, like SNP chip, but it's actually SNP, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. And basically what that is, is it's just a single base change in the DNA. It's like a little typo. So instead of having an A somewhere, we have a T somewhere on one of those strands of DNA, for example. And so what you see on these chips is each of those stripes, like on the right, you see 12 stripes on each chip, and each of those stripes genotypes an animal. For, um, in the case of that chip, it's about 50,000 markers. And I think that's about the density of the, the goat chip. Isn't that correct, Roger? Yeah, I think it's uh, it 52K now. That's what I thought. Um, so that's around about the same density that, that we would have. I think those on the right there are actually the cattle chips, but the technology works exactly the same. So each of those stripes has a bunch of beads on it that has a bunch of probes on it that let us genotype these samples. So what we get back when we run those is a big text file that has genotypes in it. So I have AA, AB, or BB. So we know we can have one of two alleles at each of these spots. And so it's going to tell us which ones are actually present in these individuals. And that's what we're going to use in what we call a genome-wide association analysis. So Danielle, if you can go to the next slide, I'll try and talk about that a little bit. Basically, a genome-wide association analysis, it's commonly called a GWAS. Um, and basically, you genotype a large population or a bunch of SNPs, and then we ask the question, which of those SNPs is associated with which of the phenotypes that we're looking at? And the reason that's important is because most traits are influenced by a lot of different mutations within the genome, and each one of them generally contributes a small amount to the overall phenotype. Um, and so that's what a GWAS is primarily trying to identify, which of those SNPs is most strongly associated with the phenotype of interest. So 
on the slide, you see a couple of different examples of what are called Manhattan plots. And they are called that because they're supposed to look like the skyline of Manhattan. Um, but basically, you can graph a few different things with these, but the essential idea is that each of those dots represents a SNP within the genome or one of those little typos, a genetic marker, and the height of that dot in the plot represents how closely it's associated with the phenotype that we're interested in. So here there's some stuff with neat tenderness and um, feed intake and residual feed intake. And then the one in the top right um, was just kind of a general example I chose off the internet. Um, so the idea is that we want to identify those that have the really high peaks because they're the most closely associated and we have the most evidence for their association with the phenotype. And even so that that gets you a list of the markers that are most closely associated. But the other thing that we get um, through this process is we actually can simultaneously produce breeding values for all of the animals in the analysis. So not only do we get a list of markers and their effects um, and how information on how closely they are associated with the phenotype, but we also get uh, a list of breeding values for all the individuals in that analysis, and we also get breeding values for all the individuals in the pedigree um, of that analysis when we have pedigree data to input in there as well. So we can sort of do a couple of different things with this analysis, including identify those SNPs or those QTLs that are, that are um, important for predicting genetic merit in the phenotype, but we can also get that list of breeding values and kind of a prototype genetic evaluation for those different um, fiber traits. And so that's really what my team is going to be doing um, with the data that that we get in this project. And I think that'll that'll have a nice little template for how to be able to carry this analysis in the future. Um, as well as some general information on what SNPs are important for predicting genetic merit. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. So Megan said we need a large population. So we're looking somewhere maybe 800 to 1,000 animals, samples, correct? Yeah, the more the better. So that's that'd be great. Yeah. So to do this, what we're really looking at uh, associate is fiber diameter and some fiber characteristics then with, with the genome. So the samples that will be collected for this analysis, and we'll go through this. I want you to go to that next slide, Danielle, please. So the, the samples that uh, initially uh, we're going to want our uh, sample of fiber, and uh, these fiber samples are going to be analyzed down at Texas A&M, and perhaps you're all familiar with, with that. Uh, we will need a two inch by two inch side sample. We'll go over that later on here. And for the genetic data, then we want to use the follicle bulb of plucked guard hair. So when the guard hair is plucked, the follicle bulb is retained. And then those are really the only two samples that we're going to require. The other information then is the pedigree data. So this form that you're seeing here is the sample form that you will fill out and then send in with the fiber and the guard hair samples. And we'll have videos here showing how we'd like you to do that just so that it's all done in a consistent manner. So all these samples uh, will be sent to me at Langston and we'll be the clearinghouse for then sending samples to Texas A&M and then sending samples to Neogen in Nebraska for DNA extraction and analysis. All right. So on this form, you can see producer information. Uh, you will include all that. And then starting in that column that is animal ID, then you would fill that information off, off to the right. Again, we'll, we will assign a farm ID for you know, analysis purposes so that uh, the, the groups are kept, the animals are kept together by, by farm in that analysis. So some things, uh, collection date, body weight of collection, staple length will go through uh, yield whenever that is, is completed if you do measure yield. Um, 
So things that are missing in, in, in here, if you don't have some of that information, that's okay. Just send as much, you know, as much as, as you can. And there, my address is there, phone number and email. So how this will work with the grant is that you will be responsible for the postage to mail the samples to me. And then the grant has funds to mail the samples and to pay for the analysis at Texas A&M and at Neogen. So really all you need to pay for is getting the samples to Oklahoma. And then during the time of this grant, then the grant will pay for that, that uh, fiber analysis and you'll get those results as well. I mean, we'll get those results and you'll get those results too. So that's uh, just that postage to Langston is all that you'll be, you'll be on, the, on the hook for. Anything else on this form, Terry or Megan, before we go to the pedigree form? I have a question. Sure. Uh, you described clip sample and follicle sample. Um, probably most of us comb our goats out. So is there a difference that you're making between those goats that are sheared versus goats that are combed? For the Texas A&M analysis, we, we need that, that little two inch by two inch clip sample. And then how you take care of the rest of the animal, that's, that's, up, that's up to the individual, that's up, that's up to you. We have a few more questions in the chat. Um, okay. If no pedigree information is available, can people still participate? Yes. And then the other one is, do we need to wait until the goats are one year old? I don't know, Megan or Terry, you have thoughts on that? I don't know as you really necessarily would need to. Um, from a genetics perspective, the DNA is the same, regardless of when the sample would be collected. My only question would be, and, and I don't know enough about fiber to tell this, <laughs> um, would be, you know, is there any time effect with the fiber traits? Yeah, I think the, the fiber and you producers can correct me. It, it, it may be a bit finer on the kids versus after they age a year or two. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So if we wanted to standardize at a minimum of one year, then that data would all be consistent. And I would say Roger and, and everyone involved is that uh, we could have the younger animals because we could actually enter that into um, as a, uh, the age as a covariate or as a categorical variable in the model and to be able to account for those. Um, it, we may not have the, those numbers that Megan was talking about to uh, adequately separate those effects out, but we could still try and account for some of it. And it may be that if you're sampling something that's less than a year old this year, and then next year we still have funding for the tests, then some of those animals that are one year could be resampled and we could look at that difference as well. That is correct. Yeah, the big thing that would be helpful from the analysis standpoint on that would be having um, accurate ages on yeah. those animals so that we can sort of account for the differences in age. And then can you right. describe sampling of a follicle? Yeah, we'll, we'll see that in, in one of the, the videos we're gonna show, how we'll get that. Uh, next, let's go to the next the pedigree form. And Megan, you wanna chat a little bit here about the pedigree form? Sure, the, the pedigree form is, um, looks fairly complex, <laughs> and, but when you get it, um, what we've really tried to do is make it as straightforward as possible. So that first column is just going to be a one through however many animals you submit. So you don't need to worry about any specific information for that. The next will be the animal ID in column B. And you wanna make sure that that matches whatever animal ID that you provided on the sample submission form so that we can match those two pieces of information together. 
Um, the next column is just a management group. So if you're familiar with contemporary grouping, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. So the idea is if you manage all of those animals the same, they were in the same place, you manage them the same, um, you could just put all ones in that column. But if you had two different groups of individuals, for example, that were managed a little bit differently or in really different um, locations, you could put one group with all ones, the next group with all twos. So it doesn't need to be anything fancy there, but just something to give us an idea if there were differences in management between those animals. Um, the next is just weaning weight and weaning date. And the only reason we would be interested in those would be um, potentially as, as covariates in the analysis, as Terry mentioned, if we need to account for differences in body size and things like that. Um, and the next columns are the pedigree information. So sire and dam um, are pretty self-explanatory. From there, those next columns are gonna be the sire's sire, the sire's dam, the dam's sire, the dam's dam, and so on. Um, and essentially in, in each of those column fields, I've tried to say, okay, the, the sire's sire is the sire of the individual in column F. So I've tried to refer to the previous animal so that it's a little bit easier to keep track of, of which animals sire and dam that we want in, in that. And then of course, if you have any comments, you're welcome to enter them in that final column. Does that cover everything, Roger? And if uh, you had any data on the uh, the sires or the sire sire in terms of mean fiber diameter or something that that can be included in that comments section as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, if if that's the case, you want to make sure. For example, if you have fiber information on the sire of five hundred six Y, you would want to make sure that the ID that's provided in that sire column matches um, the form that we looked at earlier that would contain the actual fiber information. And if you had historical fiber data, that, that could be used as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We have a few questions in the chat. Um, huh? Are you asking people to do the clipping at peak cashmere growth? Is that correct? Yeah, we want staple length. So however you would sample when you when you're measuring staple length, that's what that's what we would like. Um, another um, question is if they don't have a wean weight or a wean date, that's okay, correct? According to the green text. Yep, totally yep. fine. Um, another question is which test will be used uh, to do the five. We're using the snippet analysis at, at Texas A&M. And I think Dawn Brown was on, Dr. Brown was on an earlier webinar that talked about that. So the OF The OFDA 2000. Mm -hmm. I see Wendy shaking her head. You're muted. <laughs> the 2000 needs to, to do the snippets. They need to run in an attachment that they have on the 2000 that is the OFDA 100. And the difference is that when you use the 2000, you're measuring against a staple length and they're also not cleaning the fiber. And with the OFDA 100, they clean the fiber and they use snippets. And that a, gives a much more realistic, actually accurate evaluation of the diameter. And globally for cashmere, the OFDA 100 is what is used. So uh, that's why I asked if it's the 2000 and they're not doing it in the 100, that can be an issue for those of us raising cashmere goats that are working really hard on our diameter. I, I know. Dr. Brown in that lab is, is uh, uh, they got their OFDA 100 back up running. They had some issues with it, I believe, and they're going really? to continue with that trial. I think that that uh, um, is, is gonna be done comparing the 2000 and the 100. Well, wait, 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 wait. Oh, go ahead. Peter's speaking. 
Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that when, when we talked to Angus McCall and others, um, that <clears throat> that when they when people talk about the 2000, they're talking about a staple length measurement along specific fibers at five mil, five micron intervals. That and that has really been so different from what we've had um, traditionally and worldwide standard, um, <clears throat> which is using the 1000 or the 100 technology and uh, doing it on SNP. And we've tried to square that away. I mean, Danielle, you, you worked real hard at that. But it seems to me that there's still some confusion on, on a laboratory evaluation of, of cashmere. And I, I, think, I think this is a great uh, project. I would love to see it happen if you could match the, um, the genotype with what you're getting on the testing from the lab. I think the hard part here is the testing from the lab still. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll, I'll visit with Dawn again on the, the OFDA 100. Oh, there she is. Yeah, yeah. we'll let uh, Dr. Brown. We're going to run on the OFTA 2000 in snippet mode, which is what you're calling the 100 mode. So mm -hmm. the fiber is canteened, uh, it is chemical washed, it is slided and then it is run on the 2000 and in what we call snippet mode, what you're calling 100 mode. Yep. So, you know, we saw everybody yeah. would love to keep using the OFDA 1000, but you, everyone in this industry needs to be prepared for when it is no longer in existence. So, to me, the progressive approach would be to do the study between the, the OFTA 100 and the OFTA 2000 in the same mode, same fiber, which is the, the planned study we have with the Cashmere Goat Association outside of the Langston, uh, yeah. the data we're collecting for Langston. Um, you know, we're going to, to, to show you those, but in the, the reality is that the, it is run on DOS, the OFTA 100, it is not supported. Uh, outside of Langston, who has a has an OFTA they're not using, there are no other parts in the U.S. Nobody's supporting this this machine. So, you know, the time is to get comfortable with the data from the 2000 in snippet mode and move forward with that because eventually you're you're just not going to have an option to even compare the two. So, could could we hear from Andrew James on that? He just put up something. What are you using in Australia? Oops, I'm mute. You might be muted. The um, um the OFTA, yeah, I think it's the OFTA 2000 is actually manufactured in Perth, Western Australia. Um, so they measure about 10,000 fibres from the sample. And from that, we get um, yield or, or fibre diameter all the calculations on fiber diameter, but we also get a printout of the um, medulated fiber. And so you get a distribution for the primary follicles and a distribution for the medulated ones. Um, and then from that, you can calculate a yield um, based on estimated weight of both fractions. Um, and let this go. And on. they do all that for us for about $3 Australian. So it's really quite a good price. Um, so that's what we use for um, measuring um, fiber diameter yield down weight on our animals. Thank you. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> uh, one Thank more you. question. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've also used the SNP chip. Um, we did uh, that to look at the location of the pole gene, um, which that, that publication's in the scientific literature somewhere. Um, but probably you also need to go back and look at Patty and Restall's um, data or publications. Um, can't remember where they are, but if you need to find them, they're from the late 80s. Um, so uh, they looked at a lot of the genetic correlations, but of course the um, genomics wasn't available then. Very cool. Thank you. We, we have another question in the chat about animal ID. Is that any unique identifier like an ear tag or a microchip ID? 
you know, would be the unique identifier you would use in your, in your herd. So an ear tag or microchip number, as long as it's unique to that animal. And would that be the same with the sire dam information? Yeah, just a, a unique identifier to that, to that Great. animal. And Thank I don't know, perhaps there are some sires or dams that have been owned by different cashmere producers. Um, and hopefully if they have changed ownership and they're listed in pedigree, then they would still have that same unique animal ID amongst different farms and producers. Thank you. Any other questions on this? If not, we'll, we'll go down and look at some of these videos that we, we have. Okay, Danielle. So this is, again, how we'd like the samples collected, the series of videos, so that they're all done consistently. And I need to thank Heidi Dickens for, for doing this and allow us to use her equipment or, and, and, and her animals for this. Uh, in collecting the sample, it's best to use a, a type of clipper similar to this. Um, this is one in uh, livestock that's known as a blocking, blocking blade or blocking clippers um, used for show animals. You can also use uh, the clippers that would, you would use at home to cut your husband or your child's hair. Um, and you'll notice these have the size of the head is approximately two inches. So these will be collect the right sample size without having to make multiple passes. Well, but you want something that gets close to the skin so it doesn't have much space between the comb and the blade length. Um, and this will get very close to the skin so you'll get a true idea of the length of the cashmere from a sample collected with this type of clipper. Shall I queue up the next video? Um, yeah, just go right ahead. Plugging. We'll take questions then after all four are done. Great. After you have your goat secured in a stand, um, you're going to come along and feel for the last rib. It's easy to feel along the side. And then feel for the end of the spine known as a transverse process, you're going to put your, your fingers in that little notch and let your thumb fall kind of where it would naturally fall. And this is the area that we're going to be collecting the sample from. So we're going to go in and find where the skin is. And then we're going to lay the clippers next to the skin and go up approximately two inches. Then we're going to gather the sample, trying to keep it in its original architecture with the cut side all together. And we're going to put this into our pre-labeled bag. To collect our DNA sample, we need to pluck guard hair from the goat. The easiest place to do this is somewhere on the ridge line where it's the guard hair standing up or the tail. Um, we have to make sure that when, we, when you do the guard hair, you get the follicle bulb that's at the end of the guard hair. Um, there's no DNA in the guard hair, so if we don't have the follicle bulb on the end, the sample will not be usable. Um, but either place, that you can get it is fine. You just need to look at it and make sure that you have the bulb on there and you'll need at least 20 hairs that have the bulb on them in order for them to extract enough DNA.
Now I have my sample that I've sheared off of the goat and it's still in its, its original architecture. I'm going to take off a piece that's about finger, finger width or thumb width and it's still in its original architecture and you can see the cashmere is kind of shrunken up from the end, the cut end. So I'm just going to grab all the guard hairs that are cut while holding onto the sample and pull those out. So this is poor man's de-hairing. I'm going to get enough of those out that I can see the actual end of the cashmere, where the cashmere starts. I don't have to get them all out. On the other side of the sample, just the ones that are easy, I'm going to tease these out. I'll hold the other end and I'll pull some some of the ones that I think are not truly from end to end on the sample. till I get a sample that's spread out and I can see where the tips are and I can clearly see where the cashmere starts. And I'm going to lay that down on a piece of paper that is a contrasting color to the color of the cashmere. And I have my ruler here. So I'm going to lay that out and put my ruler to a approximately where the cashmere starts and then look to where the cashmere ends. And on this sim sample, I would say that the cashmere ends at around 67 millimeters. Sometimes you can put your ruler on top if you're having trouble with the edge of the sample isn't as, as uh, demarcated and you can start your ruler here and you notice my cashmere is still going, the majority of it is still going at around the 67 millimeter mark. So we're going to prepare the labels. I like to use um, an Avery label or some kind of mailing label um, that then I can stick on the bags since the Sharpie does, tends to smear on these bags. So I will go ahead and um, label the number of the goat, the goat's name, so that I have two forms of identification on each bag, and the date of collection. I'm going to make a second label for our uh, follicle sample to send that. So date, number of the animal, and their name. Or if you have double tags, you could use their second uh, tag number. So for the follicle, we're going to use a small sack, snack size. You can use whatever size Ziploc bag you have on hand. Now for the follicle sample, we'll use a paper towel and we will place the follicle sample on the paper towel, making sure that we have guard hair that has the follicle on there and fold the paper towel over that will kind of help keep the guard hair together. I like to open these bags before I start doing things, but I didn't on that case. And we'll slide the sample in the bag. And squeeze out the air and secure the baggie. Now that we've measured the length, you can put this aside and keep this for your own sample. The rest of the sample, we're going to put it, keep it in its architecture, and now we're going to place it into the pre-labeled bag. We'll keep its architecture as well as we can. Now you can see the cut sides over here and the to the air side is over there. And then we'll flatten the air out and seal the bag. This sample will be going will be being sent to Texas A&M Labs.
All right, thank, thank you, Danielle. Sure. So we made these, uh, these videos really so that all samples were collected in a consistent manner from roughly the same, same area on the side of the goat. And staple length measured somewhat similarly. And again, it's your best, you know, your, your, your best guess at that. And then have those samples uh, packaged and then mailed to me at, at Langston. So yeah, this is a little paper that Megan, uh, along with uh, Raluca Matescu at Oklahoma State University, she was there then, they, they're both different institutions now, uh, but uh, wrote just a little overview on the use of genomics in meat goats as part of our meat goat production handbook. And uh, Danielle has a copy of that and she's emailed that around or if you need it, why well, just request that. Pam and Joanne are also working to set up a page on our Cashmere Goat Association website where we're going to home all of these documents that you provided to us in a single, easily accessible location. Yeah, and you can post those videos or, I mean, they're, they're in a Dropbox folder now. The, the link to the Dropbox folder could be emailed to people as well if, if they wanted to look at those again or anything. So whichever way you want to do that, Danielle's fine. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, Megan, question here, will we receive the EBVs for the animals we submit? Um, unless you guys have any confidentiality issues, um, I, I don't see why we couldn't provide that information. Yeah. Uh, that, that'd be fine with me. Okay, sure. So, um, yeah, what other questions we have? I think someone asked, about the clippers, um, I forget what the name of those clippers are, but probably most any livestock supply store would have that. Or again, um, you know, I cut my own hair, people at work probably know that or notice that. So, you know, the, the clippers I buy from Walmart could maybe be used in a pinch. So, you know, you could, you could do that as, that as well. Danielle, were there any other questions that, that people had at the moment? Uh, it looks like we got a few more questions about when to collect. And again, you mentioned when you're going to harvest the cashmere is the time that you should collect this sample, correct? Yeah, yes, please. Uh -huh. Yeah, Lynn, I see you had a hand up. Nope. Oh, okay. Accidental hand. <laughs> Waving me off. All right. Yeah, I see uh, uh, David mentioned about a, a some Chinese studies perhaps that have looked at genes related to cashmere traits. And I'm sure Megan will, will put her graduate student on, on searching for that information. Yeah, I might uh, address that really quickly if you don't mind, Roger. Sure. Um, so one thing that we'll do in, in this study is we, is we really wanna focus on what the SNP effects are and the um, the EBV generation for the animals specifically in this study. Um, so that actually brings up a really good point in that the, the results of the study and the SNP effect estimates and things like that are going to be the most accurate and the most useful for the individuals that actually provided data to go into the analysis. So um, that is kind of an incentive, um, if you will, to, to kind of participate in the study if you are able to and, and if you're interested. Um, we won't specifically look for those when we analyze the data because we SNP effect estimates and things like that can be very population specific. Um, so we want to make sure that what we end up with is representative of the data that actually went into the project. So um, we won't necessarily look for that up front. We'll do the analysis independently of that. But on the back end, we certainly will take um, you know, the SNPs that were important in our analysis and, and take a look at the literature and compare to what's already out there and what has been found in other studies. So we won't necessarily look for it up front, but we will certainly consider those things um, on the back end. Thank you. Great Megan. question. Yeah, I see Lynn asked about a print 
alternative. Yeah, I think if people need things hard copy, uh, we can certainly certainly handle that, Danielle or, or, or me or somebody can handle that. So. Um, I, uh, are there any other questions? I don't really have anything else uh, at the moment. Again, we just wanted to introduce this grant, go through that sampling procedure, go through those forms so that as you're working with your goats here as the, in the, the spring, that when it's time for you to collect those samples, go ahead and do that, fill out those forms, that paperwork, and then send that to me so we can begin collecting all of these samples. And again, we want you know somewhere between 800 and 1,000 and 1,000 goats sampled. So it will probably take uh, Dawn's group just a little bit of time to run that much fiber through the lab. So uh, as, as we get things and we get them in you know, nice little bundles, then we'll be sending those off so that uh, that can be that can be done. Um, well, can I ask a question, David, here? Um, the BVs, will they be evaluated off animals as they age, as far as their reliability and their consistency? Like they'll be uh, testing the same animal over two or three years to see if those markers are, are equally relevant? Yeah, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, it sounds like you're getting at whether we would have repeated records in the analysis and account for repeated sampling over time. Um, if we do have enough repeated samples over time, we can certainly run a repeated records analysis and account for any permanent environment effects and things like that that affect those um, evaluations. Um, at this point in time, I'm not sure. Roger, do you know how many years of data sampling we might have? It, it, it's really going to depend on how many goats we get, but I'm sure it's no more than no more than two. I mean, this is only a three-year okay. grant, so you know we need to get you're going on getting the samples and the analysis. So it's not it's not really a long-term grant, although I think you know the data might be there for for people who may want, wish to use it some some point in the future. Yeah, I was kind of referring to aging effect as far as uh, coarsening with age and mm -hmm. some of those uh, criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that may be a, a, a new grant. Question in the chat is, if we have historic samples from current animals, would those also be helpful to your analysis? Yeah, so if you have um, fiber information from, let's say, sires or dams within the pedigree um, of animals that you're submitting for the project to be genotyped, those are absolutely records that we can utilize. Um, the big thing is that I understand some of those samples may have been um, run through different labs. So we want to make sure that we account for that in the analysis. So um, if you can provide um any information on where the sample was run um that would be very useful um in that project and also um genetic evaluation is all about contemporary groups and management groups and things like that so if you have samples from say all the individuals within that group that's going to be um the most useful information Comment from um, Dr. Brown that she has a new full-time tech and is ready to go with all of our samples. That's great news. Um, one more question. Being it, it's only a three-year grant, do we need to limit the age of cashmere goats that we sample? I wouldn't see a need where we'd really need to limit that. Any other questions? If you do have any others, um, you know, our emails are there. You could email me or, or, or Megan or Terry, and uh, we'll make sure that, you know, that we get the information that you need to you. And Danielle can help facilitate that as well. She has all of our contact information and, and so on. So. Um, I just unmuted myself to say thank you. This is just wonderful. And the participation by people, not only of being here, but also giving comments and sharing is just 
it's great. And I've, I've done well putting up with my husband. No, wait a minute. <laughs> I, just, I also wanted to say that, uh, Heidi, you did a great job. That's a tutorial yeah. in sampling apples to apples. And even people who comb, we comb, but even people who comb, if you're going to put it in a test like this, then, then do a two inch sample. So uh, good job with that. I think that's, that should be the standard we look at for the sampling. So, thank you everybody so thank much. You. Danielle, I want to mention also thank that all you. those videos that was are really included good. on our YouTube station and all the documents um, through today's presentation and the paperwork needed for this project will be on our website under a tab. I don't know if you want to explain that further so folks know that it is, it's all available for you to look at and use as a resource. Correct. Pending. So give us a few more days to get that up and going, but we will have a tab on the CGA website um, that will have all of this information. Um, but the video is already there on the uh, our YouTube channel. So on, on, on behalf of Meg and Terry and myself, I'd like to thank all of you producers who are going to be participating because if, I mean, if we didn't have you guys participate, then we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the project. And I also want to mention that in this proposal, there was, uh, um, and I don't know who, who wrote that from the CGA, sent me information that I included word for word in the, uh, in the proposal. So that was, that was part of the evaluation that went through. So I have to, to thank the CGA as well for, for helping me to get this grant so that we can do this work and you guys did a great job well this is really exciting so um thank you all for joining um and uh till next time i guess thank you everyone have a good thank night you, Danielle. thank you bye, bye, -bye. thank you good night